talked before about some of the prime movers for longevity and all risk mortality. Um, and I'd love for you to review a little bit of that for us. Um, I think we all know that we shouldn't smoke because it's very likely that we'll die earlier if we smoke. In that context, what are the things that anyone and everyone can do, should do to, to live longer, basically? Is it's really agnostic to how you die. And that doesn't always make sense. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, a, a very specific intervention like an anti cancer therapeutic, you really care about cancer specific mortality or heart specific mortality. But when we talk about these sort of broad things, we like to talk about ACM. So, you know, using smoking, smoking is approximately a 40% increase in the risk of ACM. What does that translate to? And um, that means I'm. I'm shortening my life by 40%. No, it means at any point in time, there's a 40% great, greater risk that you're going to die relative to a non-smoker and Got a it. never smoker. Got yeah, it. yeah. so it's important to distinguish. It doesn't mean your lifespan is going to be 40% less. It means at any point in time standing there, your risk of death is 40% higher. Hmm. So smoking and diabetes will double or triple your risk of death, depending on the time frame you're looking at. Having very high cardiorespiratory fitness, so having a VO2 max that is elite, we would define that as the top 2.5% of the population, compared to below average, is a five-fold reduction in all-cause mortality. Wow. Death from any kind. Whoa. I mean, there, we, there, we don't have drugs that have a 5x reduction in mortality. That's incredible, and that's just elite cardiovascular health. Right. And then when you layer in strength and muscle mass, um, we actually now have pretty good data as to the fact that strength is more important than muscle mass. We just use, muscle mass is a good proxy for strength, but if you just focus on strength, that's the metric that matters. It's about a threefold reduction in all cause mortality when you compare high strength to low strength. I think exercise is the single most important longevity drug we have, bar none. Mm. Like if you, if, you were, if you said like, I wanna go deep down the rabbit hole of living longer, what do I need to do? It's, it's like a super well-crafted exercise program that is geared towards strength, muscle mass, and cardiorespiratory fitness. So it's all of the above. It's not just one. Each year, I try to bring one new focus into our practice. And the past 12 months, the focus has been entirely around taking exercise to a new level in terms of our understanding of how to fine tune it. And the data are unbelievable, right? So if you... Everybody knows that if you smoke or have diabetes, your risk of death goes up a lot. But your risk of death from having high cardiorespiratory fitness goes down by much more than your risk of death goes up from smoking or diabetes. What we know is exercise is the single biggest elixir for brain health. Um, and it's amazing how, you know, how much more powerful it appears to be than nutrition, even sleep, and those That's things are very important, but That's, exercise wow. is in a league of its own. Uh, and we, we studied this question extensively about eight years ago, and I didn't, I initially just refused to believe this was the answer because it seemed too simplistic. I thought there had to be something more powerful, but as important as sleep, nutrition are, exercise kind of takes the cake. Um, and I suspect it's because it impacts so many systems, glucose disposal, insulin sensitivity, um, inflammation, it produces growth factors for neurons, BDNF. Um, so the most important thing they can do for their brain health is to exercise. That's where you get into the, hey, if you could do three hours a week, that's great. If you can do seven hours a week, it's even better. If you look at cardiorespiratory fitness, it's even more profound. So um, if you look at people who are in the bottom 25% for their age and sex in terms of VO2 max, and you compare them to the people that are just at the 50th to 75th percentile, um, you're talking about a 2x difference roughly in, um, in, in, in the risk of ACM. If you compare the bottom 25% to the top 2.5%, so you're talking about you know bottom quarter to the elite for a given age, um, you're talking about 5x, wow. 400% difference in all-cause mortality. That's probably the single strongest association I've seen for any modifiable behavior. Um, dead hang for about a minute. Seems like a, a really good goal for a lot of people, at least. To... That's our that's our goal. I think we have a minute and a half is the goal for a 40-year-old woman. Two minutes is the goal for a 40-year-old man. So we adjust them up and down based on uh, age and gender. Great. And then uh, the wall sit, what's, what are some we numbers? We don't use that... a wall sit. We do a, a, just a straight squat, air squat at 90 degrees. Um, and I believe two minutes is the standard for both men and women at 40. Great. 
And then, uh, because for some people thinking in terms of VO2 max is a little more complicated, they might not have access to the equipment or the, to measure it, et cetera. Um, what can we talk about, think about in terms of cardiovascular? So run a mile at uh, seven minutes or less, eight minutes uh, or less? That's a good question. Um, we, use, we use farmer carries. So we'll say for a male, you should be able to farmer carry your body weight for, uh, I think we have two minutes. Right. So that's half your body weight in each hand. Um, you should be able to walk with that for, for two minutes. Um, for women, I think we're doing 75% of body weight or something like that. Yeah. Great. I, I love it. Um, as indirect measures of how healthy and yeah, huge we are and how long we're going to yeah, live. It's basically grip strength. It's mobility. I mean, again, walking with that much weight for, for some people initially is really hard. Um, you know, we use different things like vertical jump, ground contact time, if you're jumping off a box, things like that. So it's, it's really trying to capture... And it's it's an evolution, right? Like I think the the test is going to get only more and more involved as we as we as we get evolved. So when you're doing that, do you think that the best is like an Airdyne that works the arms and the legs, or do you think just a regular bike that just works the legs? Like what is for zone two? I mean, it, it really just matters that you're consistent. But um, I think most people find you can do a higher output when you're on an air bike in terms of absolute wattage because you are leveraging upper and lower body, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter that much. I mean, you can do this on a treadmill, you can do this on a stair climber, you can do this on- Any kind of cardiovascular activity, yeah. but you need 45 minutes four times a week. That would that seems to be the minimum effective dose on zone two. Now People who exercise tend to have better health and live longer than those that don't. The good news about exercise is that most of the benefit occurs with mild to moderate amounts of exercise. The benefit curve flattens significantly when exercise is intense and prolonged. In other words, really pushing yourself hard doesn't give much added benefit. In fact, one study shows that recreational exercisers have their immune system stimulated, so they tend to have fewer colds and flus. One study showed that the recreational exercisers only got sick 50% of the rate of sedentary people. The highly entrained endurance athlete, on the other hand, had four and a half times more colds and flus than the sedentary person. Exercise for longevity is to lift weights. Yeah, you, it, you know, when we talk about longevity, or should I say when longevity and exercise are talked about in mainstream uh, news or even studies, what they typically talk about is uh, cardiovascular activity, right? Just being active. Right. Well, we now have studies to support what we've known for a long time, which is that strength training has profound effects on longevity. And here's something in, even more interesting. A new study came out comparing or showing the effects of, of uh, resistance training on longevity. Resistance training or gym type resistance training. They, they put that all together. So it's not like these are hardcore bodybuilders or whatever. They're just doing some form of strength training. And here's what they found that was different between the longevity benefits of strength training versus the longevity benefits of aerobic or cardiovascular training. Mm. Reduction in cancer risk. Oh, wow. Strength training had a significant reduction in cancer risk that we don't see. We are preventing getting old, preventing diseases, preventing cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's. Who would not want that? And when we extend lifespan, it's not keeping people in nursing homes for longer. Who would want that? It's allowing people to be 85 and 90, even 100, to play tennis and hang out with their families and start a new career. The best example I can give you is my father. Um, he, was, he retired at 67 and was not looking forward to being 80. He was thinking he'd be in a wheelchair like most 80-year-old men, if not in the ground. He's now 82. He's fitter than me, stronger than me, more excited about life than me, seriously. He's got a great social life. And he has no diseases, no aches or pains, mentally extremely sharp, and has started a new career. This is what 82 should look like. 